Hello, ladies and gentlemen of the internet. My name is Jacoby, aka the Habitual Pixel. This is my good friend, Big Nasty Productions. And today, we are going to review and talk about American Sniper, the 2014 Indeed. film, but directed by Clint Eastwood, starring Bradley Cooper. And this is going to be the first film on our um, Road to the Oscars 2015 thing that we did last year on my long forgotten channel. There, we watched all the uh, all the Oscar nominations, and and we review them. You know, pick our favorites, and hopefully get to see some films we wouldn't normally catch during the year and stuff like that. So, yeah. Anywho, we've arrived at American Sniper, our first choice. Um, you want to break down the story a little bit? Uh, sure. Well, uh, obviously, I'm sure everybody knows this is based. On the autobiography, the book American Sniper, Most Lethal Sniper in U.S. History, by Chris Kyle, the movie that the film is about, um, who was tragically shot in 2013 uh, by a U.S. Marine that he was trying to help who suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Him and his friend Chad Littlefield were both gunned down in a gun range when they took him there for a shooting day. Um, anyways... So the film follows Chris Kyle's life from early childhood when he make, uh, stops his first heartbeat, as they put it, and uh, follows him all the way up. his first heartbeat. <laughs> stops, but sure. Uh, and then follows work as well. <laughs> and so then it follows him up, obviously, all the way through into his military career, where he did become the most lethal sniper in U.S. Uh, military history, claiming a confirmed 160 kills. Which That's is confirmed. pretty, which is pretty crazy if you think about it, really. It is. Um, and then it uh, obviously follows up all the way to his untimely death. Now, before we get started, obviously, I think we should point out that with a bunch of controversies and whatnot surrounding the film, especially with whether or not a lot of it's truthful or uh, yeah. that it's pro-war stance and this and that. First off, I gotta say, as far as the pro-war stance goes, in my opinion, I mean, this I could be wrong, and Clint Eastwood could be, you know, just doing it because that's his stance uh, or his opinion on uh, what the war in Iraq was really about, and uh, so on and so forth. But to me, you're showing it's a film about Chris Kyle, and you're yeah. kind of supposed to be going on this journey with this guy, uh, seeing things from his perspective, correct? It's, so it's far more a story about one man than it is an, a story about any sort of agenda, really. See, and that's what I mean. So if it's if it's more so about Chris Kyle, and it's more so from his perspective, then maybe it's supposed to be portraying his way of thinking. I don't see why people can't seem to wrap their head around that. That's just how it seems to me. Um, I don't know if that is what he planned to do, or if he's with just his pro war. But people seem to mistake that um, movies are about characters and stories that uh, aren't necessarily what the people making the film feel or, you know, even necessarily agree with. They could be, I mean, there's tons of characters who play villains and bad people. And Hitler, yeah. for example, you think they... No, it's their job. You act. That's, that's the art form. Um, so, yeah, we can talk more about various controversies, different parts of the story being, you know, exaggerated or left out altogether. But, or we could just, you know, we can start with the movie itself if we want. Oh, yeah. I mean, realistically, if you think about it, whether or not things were left out, or especially from the book, if they were exaggerated, the film is based on the book, not based on whether or not the book was truthful. Mm -hmm. So, as that's, you say... Yeah, and that's kind of the point, right? This is a... Just let it be a story. Just mm -hmm. let it be a story, goddammit. Yeah, take so, it as is. I just wanted to make sure we got that out of the way yeah. before we... We sure we dove into what I do think is a highly entertaining film, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's uh, well acted, decently well directed. Uh, mm -hmm. Clint Eastwood continues to prove he knows film so goddamn well. <laughs> and now, no, sorry, not to cut you off, but no, no, now, it, just because of in regards to the fact that we are doing this for the 2015 Oscars, as far as Road to the Oscars. Why exactly do you think Clint Eastwood got snubbed as far as Best Director? Do you think this film, judging from some of the other ones that you have seen of the Oscar nominations, mm -hmm. um, do you think that this film does stand amongst them as far as directing goes, or do you think it's a little bit uh, less impressive as far as the direction? Um, hmm. I think it's a better acted film than it is directed, I guess. 
I would agree with that. Um, and I'm just hold on. I'm just scrolling towards the other people. Yeah, it looks like all the other films nominated for best directing were also nominated for best picture. Mm-hmm. And uh, it seems like Clint Eastwood got left out of that. I don't know. I don't think like a director like Wes Anderson, for example, with Grand Budapest. This he has such a crazy art form to the way he does his shit. Like it's clearly a ne- some next level bizarre filmmaking. And I don't think Clint Eastwood's necessarily in that ballpark, but uh, similar to Alejandro, don't know his last name for uh, Birdman, Birdman or The Virtue yeah. of Ignorance. Because um, that was a very well-directed film, I thought. Like, not, I don't know, it's hard to say that in a blanket statement, but... Just in comparison, I mean, we are yeah, obviously just, just saying this for comparison's sake. When we're talking about the craft of making the film itself, which, exactly. is, which is what the director's job is, um, I don't know, I think he should have been on that list. Should he, have, should he win? Maybe not, considering the other excellent films this year. We'll see, we'll see. But um, I think this was better directed than at least Gran Torino. Maybe not a million dollar baby because that film was wicked, but Gran Torino I thought was slightly overhyped, and I think this is a, uh, a step up from that directing wise, hmm. if you will. <laughs> I would agree that the acting definitely does uh, outweigh the direction of the of the film. Yeah, as far I'm as more I'm more concerned with the character. As far as what stands out. Yeah, I'm more concerned with the characters than um, necessarily the story that's going on, if you will. Well, and as a lot of people also have pointed out as well, the the pacing of the film is a little bit uh, s- speedy, if you will, and kind of jumpy, kind of jumps back and forth between different scenes without kind of explaining too much. Mm-hmm. You almost only see the story in glimpses rather than being told a full story, if yeah. that makes sense. He, but um, I think Clint did a good job of still getting across what you needed to know throughout yeah. th- throughout the 10 years of his life and that's um, that's what's really most important with movies that stretch over such a long period of time is that you you know you make sure you get the information that you need and well, and, it, yeah. and not to mention aside from aside from the fake baby or fake babies considering there is which we'll get to, with which that we'll but aside get from to. those the film does flow well as it far does, as it does um Initially, as far as when being I able watched to view it, that. I thought it was a little too choppy, and mm-hmm. then on a second viewing, I'm like, no, they pretty much, you know, they got what they needed to cover out of each, you know, even if it's just a five-minute scene that represents, you know, four or five years of, of duty, you know, perhaps. They get what's important across, and that's, you know, like I said, that's what's most important for these epic ten-year stories, if you will. I mean, it still comes in at two hours long. I think it could have easily been three, and that would have been a problem. But uh, I'm glad they kept it. See, and mind you, I would have liked two hours. Yeah, well, I mean, but I would have liked to see, for instance, the the fact that in real life Chris Kyle was shot twice. He was in six separate IED explosions reportedly. So, I mean, I would rather see a little bit more. I guess kind of the action. A lot of that, like a lot of his career, is summarized, if you will. Mm. And I mean, I don't want it to be an all-out just war movie. I do appreciate the fact that what they're trying to do is more than that. It's more of a, a coming home film, right? It's a, it's what happens to the soldiers after war, and mm-hmm. the effects it has on them. Yeah, it's the war effect genre, if you will, like uh, Full Metal Jacket, Jarhead, a little bit, uh, mm-hmm. Deer Hunter, like you said. There's a couple other ones that I'm missing. Um, but yeah, it's about the shell shock, if you will. Yeah, and I mean, similar uh, in similarity to Vietnam films, right? Now you're seeing kind of like with Jarhead, with uh, the Gulf War, and now with uh, you know like Iraq as well. It seems like they're kind of progressing into being more about that than just simply about the war. Whereas you see with more World War Two films, it doesn't seem as much about the soldiers as it does about the mission. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whereas with this, it is about the soldier, and I mean, with Chris Kyle, it's especially with the way that, and the discussions that, uh, between Bradley Cooper and Sienna Miller's character, um, it seems like a lot of what they're talking about, as far as, from a philosophical standpoint, is the fact that his mission, is to him, is still in, a, in Iraq, while his wife wants him to take care of his family and be a good husband and stuff like that, right, and he doesn't seem to be able to adjust 
against him because he has what I believe they describe earlier as a uh, hero complex or a yeah, savior complex. A savior complex. Yeah. He um this Chris Kyle fellow is an interesting character because he he is really kind of just bred for this line of work, right? Like he I don't know, his just his uh, even in the beginning when he was thinking about signing up and uh, he saw the the uh, terrorist attacks on the U.S. Embassy and mm. whenever that was, the early 90s. Yeah, in Africa. Like, something just clicked that he needed to be a part of this and that he was just, you know, he was born to do this. I mean, albeit he joined late when he was 30, but he's still, like, he is a fucking soldier. <laughs> well, yeah, there's no doubt in my mind that, I mean, and anybody can say whatever they want about him. Uh, to, to each his own as far as opinions go but in my mind he is still a, a hero in my mind as well as a, obviously an American hero um, but at the same time it does kind of show the things that he ha you have to do as far as that sort of status and I mean he even says to the one veteran at the end where he's at the gun range with the one guy and he's uh, helping him snipe the paper targets yeah. and he says to him he's like oh who's the legend now and he says oh that's a title you don't want right it seems like, well, obviously in the film, he seems to more tackle with these demons of war from, you know, coming back home and such. Whereas in the book, um, allegedly, I mean, I haven't read it personally, but from what I've read about it, it seems that he actually had no uh, quarrel with being in war and coming back home. He actually preferred to go back if it wasn't for having to take care of his family, is what he says in the book, I believe. Mm -hmm. And to me, that shows that Clint Eastwood is trying to more humanize a character that if you went strictly from the book would seem a little more detached from reality, right? Yeah, and I think that's just because it's, um, I believe it's his autobiography, right? He wrote it yeah. himself. So well, obviously he, he had help, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. But he's, um, he's not necessarily going to put forth that kind of emotion, right? And Clint, that's where Clint has to interpret, and I think he did a really good job of doing that, because, um, and he he does act, he, and he does uh, balance that as well with the um, the Chris just he does he wants to be back in combat he uh, he does he does have a hero complex he um, if he's not working then what is he doing and his job is to save American lives yeah I mean as far as uh, when we're talking about the the dynamic uh, interesting parts of the story with we should give credit to Jason Hall as well who I believe is the writer of uh the american sniper of the film yeah of the film yeah and then it was uh chris kyle uh scott McEwen, and who wrote the book so he did have some writers helping him out but yeah no doubt i'm sure he did, had publish publishers but <clears throat> with an autobiographical uh, tale you're there's going to be certain parts where you're going to be hesitant to uh to put in just because of you know, your own emotions or maybe it would make you look bad not every autobiography is the wolf of wall street where it's like yeah, I yeah fucking, exactly <laughs> i did cocaine fox hookers i don't care i did all that <laughs> and um may i have of course haven't read the book but maybe it's uh, a little more reserved when it came to that not to mention i mean either way clint Eastwood and jason hall both uh, together obviously did a really fantastic job of telling the story in such a different format right mm -hmm. but speaking of which what did you think of bradley cooper's performance overall i thought it was pretty damn solid it was um yeah probably the best of his career so far that i've seen anyway just because how much of the film resides on him uh initially when i started watching it i thought his accent was gonna not work <laughs> Like, I just thought it was going to slip at some point. It was like, oh, yeah. here's this redneck sniper motherfucker. <laughs> but he um, he owns the accent. He owns it well. And it's more of a, uh, like he says, a Texan accent, not a... Not a redneck not accent. Not a redneck accent. And he does. He, um, he handles the accent well throughout the film, and he does it well. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the film rides on him. It's all about him, obviously. And... He he's a good leading man. I think he's. Uh, I think this is his best performance yet. Yeah, and I would agree with you that uh, that it is his best performance yet. Obviously, excluding uh, his voice acting as Rocket Raccoon in Guardians of the Galaxy, but 
you know, uh, well, we all got to get paid, I guess. <laughs> it, it definitely feels to me like he put a lot more of himself into this character than he has in a lot of his past roles. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to drive on him for uh, past roles not being as uh, well performed, but the way that he approached this film seems like it's just a lot more. Obviously, it's a much more serious film than he's probably used to doing, really. But yeah, it's just it seems more. Uh, well honed, more, you know what I mean, more uh, uh, locked down on as far as the character goes. He seems to really be trying to portray what he interpreted from, I'm assuming, his meetings with Chris Kyle and reading the book and what he thought of how Chris Kyle should look in a film. You know what I mean? He did a great job of making it his own, I thought. Yeah, he definitely looks the part pretty much exactly, I think, so. Definitely yeah, which t- and to me that's a huge thing, and when you're doing a autobiography or a, a, like a biopic, if you will, because if you don't make that character your own while you're portraying, you're just basically a guy dressed up like you know, for instance, uh, Martin Luther King. And I'm not knocking on Selma; I'm just using it as an example. Doesn't but, exactly look like Martin Luther King. <laughs> but yeah, if you can own that character and really make it your own, people are going to believe that's that character. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whereas when I'm watching this, I think of Chris Kyle. I don't think of Bradley Cooper. Whereas I was, if I watch. For instance, Birdman, I still think of Michael Keaton or Edward Norton. I don't really think of uh, Regan Thompson or uh, Mike Shiner. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. This is the first time I've, we've uh, seen Brad really own a character. Um, I mean, I've enjoyed a lot of his past work. Even, um, how was that? Limitless was one of my mm-hmm. favorites. I thought that movie was awesome. But he's still just kind of playing Bradley Cooper. This is the first time I've seen him, like, completely transform into another character and that is chris kyle he does it well it's not uh not the easiest character to play i'm sure yeah i would definitely say it uh, overall he does do a fantastic job and i mean sienna miller although she is limited in how much screen time she really has uh mm. pl- playing the wife of, i believe her name is taya kyle yes yeah, yeah uh she does do she does do a very um i'd say exceptional job of you know the type of role that she does have of being that kind of uh, sort of wife trying to deal with the fact that her husband's at war. And for some reason, they have these constant phone calls when he's in like the middle of a firefight, which I don't understand that part. I mean, that just seems like a terrible idea. I but, think that, uh, mu- that must have been just added for, you know, that has to be a bit exaggerated. Dramatic right? effect, right? Because it happened like twice, at least twice, that. Um, they would be on a phone call on these satellite cell phones or whatever, and then a you know, an attack would happen. And there she is, pregnant and alone. Well, she's <laughs> literally hearing gunshots being fired at her husband on the other end of the world. I'm like, damn. <laughs> and I thought I had a shitty day yesterday. My God. So yeah, and while that her might be a little exaggerated, but you know, for for good reason. For well, good reason. and while her character's constantly understandably emotionally distressed but um she does a good job of i think uh making a a good connection between her and bradley cooper for the limited screen time that they do have Mm -hmm. seeming genuinely concerned and not to mention in the scene with the fake baby or at least one of the scenes of the fake baby she does do a far better job of making the fake baby seem somewhat real than bradley cooper does not yeah, that it's either their faults. That should have been pulled right away. But. She owns the fake baby, that's for sure. Um, I do want to get to the fake baby, my God, because that's like... I, don't I feel know. like it has to come up in almost every conversation. Yeah, that is the... Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to... We'll get to it in a second. But um, I did like... The one scene she did kind of own was when they first met at the bar. And I mm-hmm. thought she uh, she did a decent job of being, you know, flirty sassy yet fuck right off kind of girl <laughs> um i thought she was good uh other than that there's only like you know a handful of supporting characters in this film like a solid 90 percent of it rests completely on bradley cooper's character That's and which crazy. it should i mean it is about chris kyle but at the same time obviously they do have to include someone in his family which i was the one thing i was disappointed of which uh speaking of which with the handful of kind of side characters I do wish there was a little more um, about his brother, especially once it shows yeah. when he sees him at the uh, army base and he seems all messed up and just wants to go home and says, fuck this place. And he says, asks him again, he says it again or whatever. 
I, I wish I kind of saw more about what that was about. And, yeah, cause I, mean, so, even, I even tried looking them up on the internet, and I really couldn't find much about them as far as uh, uh, have, his thoughts it, on the war. There should have at least been a scene between them after he came home from his final tour or something. You know? mm-hmm. There should have been more significance to that, I agree. I would have liked to see Considering that. Considering he was, like, you know, doing the same job and in the same field of war, going through, you know, similar circumstances. Well, he was a Marine yeah. where Chris was a Navy SEAL. Yeah, but yeah. A little bit different, but... He was lower, much lower, but still, there is, um, you'd think there'd be some, something there to pull from, you know, story-wise. Yeah, that's where I, one of the only disappointments I have as far as supporting cast. And it's not that the brother, uh, did a bad job, it's just... Or sorry, the character of the brother did a bad job, but um, I just I wish that they had included him a little bit more in the storytelling, especially considering it seems like he's such a crucial part from the beginning, when it's you know all about him protecting his brother and they're doing everything together. Which uh, I mean, if they're doing that, you'd think that they would have invested it around the same time, right? Which they do because when he's getting married, his brother I believe was already in his marine um, uniform. So I, so, I don't know. I, I feel like they just have, it's a missed opportunity where they could have had a little more relatability to it by, you know, kind of having the family aspect involved a little bit more. Obviously, they do with the kids and with the wife and him being distant and the scene where at the barbecue, he almost beats the living shit out of the dog for what he thinks is attacking his kid, I believe. Probably just licking it. <laughs> yeah, looked like he was just licking him. But uh, I think he thought he was attacking him, or at least that's what it's supposed yeah, to be lying. He got real, real wired real quick. Real crazy and went all PTSD on his ass. And mm, I mean, they do. It's a decent job of visualizing what PTSD would you know likely be like, right? I would definitely heavy scene was when he's watching uh, the television. I and you hear all the gunshots yeah, and bombs. And you're, assuming, and you're assuming he's watching, like, I don't know, CNN or playing, or his son's playing Call of Duty or something. But yeah. then it turns out that there's no, there's nothing on the TV at all. He was just hearing that shit. And you're like, wow, yeah. No. If you could not shut off that, that sound and those thoughts, that'd be uh, some hard, a hard thing to stomach. Yeah, definitely. And, I mean, realistically, they like, even that bar scene, which Bradley Cooper owns 100 percent um when he finally comes back mm-hmm. oh yeah fuck that was his that was the best scene of his i thought that and i i honestly i really liked uh when they did the connecting piece when he actually finally shoots the kid and the mother who are trying yeah. to attack the marines just the way that he handled that scene especially after the part when he when the guy tells him he's like get the fuck off me Mm-hmm. He's just sitting there. I liked how he handled the scenes with the sniping. It, that like that to me is what really gave him that role. Like that it was that was his character. You know what I mean? It wasn't Bradley Cooper playing somebody. Like this was a, this was a character that you were watching and you actually believed it. That there's a lot of believability to it. Yeah, definitely. Believability goes a long way. I guess this can transition into that fucking baby. But <laughs> <laughs> believability goes a long way with. Uh, with stories like this, and I thought everything was just really well done, um, especially the sets and locations in the uh, the Middle East. It was all very well done. The military was on point, and all that leads to uh, believability in what Chris Kyle's doing, which is guarding over his fellow troops. But uh, one scene in particular, just uh, what would you call it, like a gross error in uh, editing or something like that? I would say it's a gross error in directing. I would say it's a gross error in uh, camera work. I would say it's a gross error in pretty much any aspect of filmmaking yeah. in 2014 uh, when this film would have been made. Mm-hmm. Or even 2000, yeah, 2014. So, yeah, I think we can just jump right into it. They used... Almost a cabbage patch kid looking doll, that level of fake to yeah. portray his infant daughter. I, I believe it was the daughter, right? That yeah, it was supposed it was to be for, yeah. his firstborn, I believe. Oh, um, so it was the son then. I, I think I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember either. But. but what we're saying here is this film that had a you know X million dollar budget. They used a fake mm-hmm. baby in a scene that required a real baby. They used a fake baby. It was a cabbage patch kid. 
or some Toys R Us shit, but the more It was a home ec baby at best. It was a home ec baby. <laughs> yeah, the ones that you have to rock back yeah. and forth. <clears throat> I mean, they they literally had to move it, the move the hand with their hands to make it seem realistic. If you watch the scene carefully, when I mean, I'm sorry, you don't even have to watch it fucking carefully, uh, especially when Bradley Cooper's character is or is holding it. Um, no, when it you see it doesn't move. No, Sienna all. Miller's holding it. You see the arm kind of bouncing up and down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Because she's clearly doing it with her hand, but she has it hidden. She has her hand hidden with the baby, so it kind of just looks like its arms moving very awkwardly and unnaturally. But then when she hands the baby off to Bradley Cooper, in an even more un a uh, very more or sorry a very uh, an even more awkward and unnatural sort of uh, uh, situation occurs where. Not only does the baby seem extremely stiff and rigid, you then see Bradley Cooper blatantly put his thumb under the wrist of the baby and start attempting to move the hand to make it seem more genuine. It's bad. Like To it's, me, I don't see how anybody is framing that shot and saying, oh, this looks good. That's what I mean. And this is such a... Um, this isn't... I mean, mistakes slip through the cracks in films. Like, you'll see extras in the background or... Maybe someone using a cell phone or a wristwatch in a movie where, you know, you, a movie about ancient times or some shit. But n very rarely is there such an oversight where it's just, uh, this scene calls for me to be holding my infant son or daughter, I can't remember, while giving, you know, a monologue of sorts. Um, and they didn't have a real baby to use, so they used a fake baby. Like well, that, should, that should never ever happen <laughs> especially in a movie that's so serious in, yeah, in nature too yeah, I mean it's it's just it's almost it's it's unacceptable I just don't I don't get it I don't understand how you could possibly think that that is acceptable they would have had better luck with a CGI baby put in in post-production it would have looked better uh, it just it makes no sense and I mean when they do the uh, when they do the scene in the maternity ward, they show clearly have babies or at least animatronic babies, something in the incubators. Yeah. They could have easily used one of those. Want to film but, that shit on nope. the same day? <laughs> we're gonna save ourselves just the tiniest possible amount of money, and we're gonna use the world's fakest baby you've ever seen what on an a, actual film. What is a baby charge for acting? Like I. <laughs> Are you telling me uh, that no member of the crew didn't have a cousin or a <laughs> sister that had a newborn? Uh, bring this, a kid to work day. Yeah, this is, you know, this is not a student film we're talking about. This is <laughs> American Sniper directed by Clint Eastwood. Um, <clears throat> it just, it, it does. It just seems absolutely ludicrous to think that they couldn't. When it's a scene that, to me, it seems is of great importance to at least conveying the final part of Chris Kyle's character, the fact that he's not comfortable at home in his surroundings, he's more comfortable back in war, yeah, because that's heavy, what he understands now, that seems scene, to be what he, what he strives for, right? He just wants to protect other uh, fellow soldiers and protect his country. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> his, his, ra his rationing, or his rationale, not mine, but uh, uh, I don't understand his logic with that regard. in that regard, but still. I believe that's to me. That's what it's. Uh, that's a lot of what it's trying to say. But What's that? I don't understand how you could possibly think that you're gonna. Oh, sorry, I said to me that's uh, what I thought it was trying to say a lot mm. as far as the yeah. with the child and how he's holding and everything. But I don't understand how you think you're gonna convey that message when the audience is goddamn distracted by the fakest baby they've ever seen on a real movie. It is distracting and it sticks out like a sore thumb, and I don't. It doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, I can okay. already think of several ways around this. One, get a real baby. Two, CGI baby. Three, frame Animatronic. the camera. Frame the camera differently. <laughs> if so they that, if, if they actually just went, to, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe six inches higher, yeah. or even even two inches higher, where a you couldn't see the zoom, babies. Maybe. Yeah, just the, the shoulders up. You would have been fine with the back of the head. Whatever. No one's even going to pay attention. They're just going to look at how Bradley Cooper's staring at Sienna Miller when he's uh, delivering his uh, monologue in that, or sorry, delivering the back and forth in that scene. Mm -hmm. But instead. You are out wide enough that you see the entire baby. You see Bradley Cooper holding it. You're focused directly on the baby, and the scene just doesn't have the same effect that it would if you had done it properly. And I mean, as I feel as though it's not anybody picking on the uh, 
the the film or any of the filmmakers involved in that part it's the fact that they blatantly disregarded that this is not acceptable in a high budget film mm -hmm. this is just a fuck up plain and simple <laughs> and uh it's rare that you see the like you know such kind of things in in the, this caliber of film but when i type in american sniper uh you get uh trailer american sniper controversy american sniper chris kyle and the fourth one down is american sniper fake baby, fake baby. Yes. <laughs> this, well, this, this got noticed put it this way with the amount of money that they spend on this film or that they spend on films in general nowadays if you think about it's unforgivable it's it's the same as if something like for instance uh, as terrible as they are already the fast and furious uh, franchise it's as, it's as if the fast and furious franchise when they had a race at one point when you saw a car drifting it was actually made of cardboard mm-hmm or they use those old timey like revolving backgrounds while they're yeah. in, while they're in the uh... <laughs> yeah and you saw it blatant. yeah and you saw it clear as day yeah saw it right out there yeah, yeah it's, it, um... it's the biggest fault in the entire movie for by far it's probably the biggest fault in a film I've seen especially of this caliber and of this uh, um, sort and, of notoriety uh, you know I what I mean I think we like, may have just answered our own question from the beginning of why Clint was snubbed for best director. Yeah, it might I have something to do with that. Probably the baby. <laughs> it's probably that baby. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I know he's get, I know he's getting old, but you have to notice that. There's no way he's sitting there staring at his monitor, going, "Yeah, this looks good." This looks good. What we all this, this looks good. You can keep that. With his fucking almost Batman-like voice. What do you mean we don't have a baby? Well, fucking get the cabbage patch kid in here. <laughs> fucking frame this shit up. Let's roll, motherfucker. I don't. I don't know. That's probably why he was snubbed, and I think that's what will keep this movie from being the one of the, you know, in the top war films ever. I think it's good, but maybe not, you know. <laughs> it's hard not to... It's hard not and to be perfectly honest, I think it's also going like to keep it out of the top running for the best picture. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think it's going to be out of the running for best picture, too. You have to... There's there's no way, judging by some of the films... I haven't watched all of the films that are in the running for best picture yet. I intend to, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen them all yet. But with the ones that I have seen... There's already definitely two that are, I don't want to say a lot better, because this is still, as I said earlier, a highly entertaining film as far as uh, um, enjoyment uh, uh, and entertainment value goes. But there is a lot of, uh, or a couple far better films as far as style and mm -hmm. direction. Oh, even, yeah, like uh, Grand Pudapest. Even, even, even acting, Just I mean. Drenched with, uh, you know with um, production value I guess like how difficult was it to put together this film and I'm, I don't know I think uh, you can't be missing shit like fake, ba fake babies to be in that that caliber and as far as story goes even though obviously this is a great story too and same with acting uh, for instance Whiplash J.K. Simmons and I'm not too sure of the uh, main character's uh, actual name the guy who the actor who plays him um, oh yeah I'm not sure but if they don't do one hell of a job, holy crap, that's probably one of my favorite ones. But anyways, back to American Sniper. I just feel that there, there are better ones than that because of that fake baby scene. There's ones that when you watch them, you don't like, because I mean, I feel like it does. I feel like it takes you right out. It took of, me out of, of like that, like instantly. Because you automatically just notice, oh my God, that's a super fake baby. And then you're lost. You're gone. Yeah. I mean, then, I, I'll, I'll give them... You have to rewind the fucking scene because bring you, you back. Yeah. But yeah, that's it's uh, it's unforgivable. <laughs> it is unforgivable. Sorry, Clint, buddy. I love you, but <laughs> this is a damn good movie. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> this is what is keeping you from greatness. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's definitely a big ass sore thumb in an otherwise very well-made film and it's a real fucking shame to see that happen yep I, yeah. I don't know what else there is to really talk about is there anything else you wanted to mention oh we could talk about as far as speaking of camera work uh, i mean the, the crew that worked the cameras obviously it wasn't clean for himself <laughs> but um uh, whoever worked the cameras. Cameras <laughs> uh the, the scenes in iraq i think were composed pretty well i think they were probably one of the top ones as far as in my opinion of uh, war films in general and especially with the new age war films being set in the middle east i think the way that they stylized it and the way that they shot it to to me it, it was it looked very authentic 
Yeah. Especially in the way that things were happening, and you know what I mean? The guys kind of came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely sim properly simulated what it would be like to um, fight in that urban kind of the Middle Eastern urban warfare, if you will, where, um, yeah, there's lots of little, lots of little, it's like almost, you know, like the reverse of the Vietnamese jungle. Like they can come out of anywhere and it's their home. They know it better than you. Like they have that advantage as well. Um, and especially, I thought they did a good job of, um, you know, showing how the, the sniper's role basically of guarding over top of a large area and they uh, they made that seem very real because he was perched on you know some pretty crazy ledges just literally being everyone's guardian angel watching over you know several different streets and a whole you know dozens of men potentially like they did a good job of realizing that visually I thought it was awesome yeah and I, and I really liked uh, the way that they shot the scenes where he was looking through the scope of the rifle mm -hmm. I thought that I thought that was exceptionally well done um especially the times when it was a little more focused and to actually see the eye like his eyeball yeah. looking through it and then the one they would do it obviously where the camera the view that you saw was through the scope I thought the way that they did that was uh really well done as well you don't see that a lot where they do it from both sides it's usually either the scope through where it's mm. the view the view is through the scope or it's the scope or sorry the view of the scope from the outside where you see the enlarged eye right yeah yeah it was interesting to see how they would flip it back and forth so that you saw him seeing what he sees you know what i mean yeah the uh, the reaction to what some of the crazy yeah. shit he was witnessing which was cool i like that and um I also like how the scope, uh, just a little camera thing, but it, like it took a second to focus in when he changed targets and mm -hmm. little things like that. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, the attention to detail on that was yeah. exquisite. It's kind of alarming how they missed a fake baby, but let's not dwell on that because that'll it's just. Like he, it's like that was a second unit director or something doing. Had that to be. Day. Had to be. Clint was out of town. <laughs> and, and that guy was hungover. <laughs> and that guy was hungover and stoned. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I eat the fake baby. Uh, he's eating nachos or something. Yeah, other than that, other than kind of like like I said, the uh, the cinematography and uh, the set design or locations that they used. Uh, um, other than that, like uh, I just gotta say that overall, again, I think it is definitely worthy of being selected as one of the uh, nominees for best picture of the year. But mm -hmm. at the same time, do I think it's in the top running for uh, winning? Not exactly. Uh, do I think Bradley Cooper deserves to be in the Best Actor nomination? Of course. Yes, I agree he does. And again, I do think he's at the top. I think he's really, like you said earlier, I think he's really seeming to come into his own as an actor. It seems like he's really finding himself as far as moving on to that serious role, similar to Steve Carell in Foxcatcher. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to see actors that come from, you know, The Hangover and whatever. You know, come from lesser roots. You know, prove me wrong about them. I like, I love it when that happens. Yeah, no, definitely. So yeah, I would just say that it is as a, it's definitely an enjoyable movie. It's definitely well made, like you said. It's um, it is definitely controversial in its ways, and I mean, everybody's gonna have their own opinion about that, no matter what we say, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I, I think most why films are made, right? So that's, uh, I think most people would like it, though. I do think it's I think it's definitely yeah. one of the best war films made in the recent memory. Mm -hmm. So if, if war films are your thing too, I, I would definitely uh, advise people to check it out. But uh, as far as a rating goes, I think I would uh, I think I'd have to go with eight point five. Yeah. Um, well, you summed it up well. I mean, I do love me a war film. I don't know if this will go down as the bet one of the uh, top ever you know just mm -hmm. because of that goddamn baby and other <laughs> things like i don't know it's good though this is um this is a solid a solid entry for uh clint eastwood and his ever growing i mean i don't know how many films he's got left in him <laughs> but uh yeah, he's pretty old he's certainly a damn he's he's proved himself when it comes to directing he's he's good at it mm -hmm. Um, I think Brad, yeah, Brad Cooper's best performance yet. I'm excited to see the future of his career. I hope he gets more awesome ass jobs like this and less Definitely. less A Team Hangover Four kind of <laughs> shit. I, that can he can just be done with that phase of his career. I think. Um, but as for a score, you a serious actor now. Yeah, you want you a big boy now. 
Um, as this, as as far as the score goes, I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna say nine out of ten because I really enjoyed it the first time through. I am deducting a full point for the fake baby, <laughs> so I would give it an eight out of ten. Still definitely worth worth the um, the price of admission, if you will. Definitely a uh, an entertaining film, but. Um, a fake baby just held it from greatness. <laughs> I would agree. Eight out of ten from me, and an eight point five from you. Yep. Um, yeah. So that wraps up our little review of uh, American Sniper. Thank you all for joining us. Um, next up, it's going to—I don't know if we've decided on one yet—but um, we're going to do all the films that have been nominated for Best Picture this year. There's eight of them, so expect seven more reviews in the near future. And um, you know, I hope you enjoy. And I'll see you all next time. How long have I been frozen? <laughs> <laughs>